Hello, my name is Peter Forsyth. I am a machine learning research engineer from Waterloo, Ontario, Canada. This is a re-recording of a talk that I gave at our machine learning and finance reading group in the summer of 2023. Our theme this summer is large language models. This talk is about large language models and labor. That is, how will the introduction of large language models affect how people work, how productive they are, and what kind of jobs they'll have? As such, this talk draws as its sources from the economics literature. I hope that you'll find it interesting. Let's get started. Okay, so the motivating question for this talk is, what will the, be the impact of large language models on work and on the labor market? So to convince you that this question is worth studying, here are some quotes. The first comes from a paper published by OpenAI, and they say that they think that approximately 80% of the US workforce could have at least 10% of their work tasks affected by large language models. Well, something like 19% of workers could have at least 50% of their tasks impacted. So quite a significant impact. Furthermore, here's another quote, this one from a report by some economists at Goldman Sachs. Now, according to their view, um, the productivity impact of generative AI, of which large language models are a significant component, could be comparable to that of previous um, transformative technologies like the electric motor or the personal computer. So clearly, serious people believe that large language models will have a significant impact on work. And therefore, I think studying the potential impact is worthwhile. Now, before proceeding, it's necessary for me to offer a disclaimer. And that disclaimer is that essentially no one actually knows the answer to this motivating question. Um, at the early stage of any technology, it's very difficult to forecast its eventual impact. To illustrate this point, on the right, here is a diagram of the miner's friend, the first industrial steam engine which was used to drain water from mines. At that early stage, it's hard to believe anyone could appreciate the world-changing ramifications the technology would have. Similarly, it's very hard to accurately forecast what, what large language models will do, how they will affect work. So given that we can't directly answer this motivating question, um, what approach should we take? Well, in this talk, I propose that we take the following approach. Um, first, we review the impact of previous technological revolutions on work as, as according to the analysis of the MIT economist, David Autor. Then um, I'm going to discuss a specific case um, of the introduction of a, large language, of a large language model in a workplace and how it impacted productivity. So I'll focus on a micro case study recently published um, in, as a National Bureau of Economics Research working paper. So in essence, we're gonna look at the past at a macro scale, and then we're gonna look to the present and the future in sort of a micro case study scale. And hopefully by combining information from these two sources, we can get some insights into what the impact of large language models could be, even if we can't um, directly and confidently answer the question. All right, let's, let's get started. Okay, so, so we're gonna start here in part one, and we're gonna talk about the impact of the last significant um, technological revolution that is the personal computing revolution. Okay, so, so to study this, it's necessary to go back in time. So let's go back to the 1980s. So what was happening in the 1980s? Well, this was the time of the development and the widespread adoption of the personal computer, a technology which had very significant impact on business. It enabled sort of businesses at large to make use of software seriously for the first time. And consequently, by impacting businesses, it impacted labor. So how has, how has labor, how has work changed since the 1980s? Well, there's, there's many ways to look at this. 
um, we'll, we'll sort of look at a macro scale here. So um, here's a plot. This plot is from a 2015 paper by David Ottor. And on the x-axis here, we have various occupational categories. And on the y-axis, we have change in employment in each of these occupational categories. And each of the colored bars corresponds to a different um, sub-interval of time between 1979 and 2012. Now, an unfortunate thing about this, this plot is that, in fact, the different sub-intervals are of different size. So it's not directly possible to compare um, the bars of different colors in this plot. However, we can compare bars of the same color across occupational categories. So in making this comparison, what, what kind of observations can we make? Well, what's interesting is that um, the occupational categories, which are arranged um, roughly by sort of pay, pay hierarchy in, in 1980, um, there seems to be something of a U-shaped pattern here. That is, there's significant growth over most of the sub-intervals over sort of the lower paying occupational categories like personal care, food cleaning services, protective services, and also significant growth at the top end in technicians, professionals, and managers. However, the growth is much more muted in the middle here in the operators, laborers, production, and office administration categories. In fact, in some cases, there's significant decline. So, so basically, what we can observe from this, this graph is like a U-shaped pattern of change of employment in the time between 1979 and 2012. Here is another view of the same category. So in this plot, we have occupations grouped by their 1980 mean wage. And on the y-axis, we have change in employment share allocated to that occupation. And again, we see something of a U-shape, a bit of a distorted U-shape. So there's growth at the bottom end, there's growth at the top end, but there's decline in employment or at least stasis in employment in, in the middle here. So, so again, we're seeing some kind of polarization in the labor force since 1980 when the personal computer was introduced. Okay, so, so in addition to looking at changes in employment, we can also look at changes in wages, real hourly wages. So we have the same x-axis here, occupations ranked by their 1980 mean wage. The y-axis, we have a measure of change in, in wage in the time since between 1980 and 2005. And so we see growth at the low end, growth at the top end, and like more muted growth in the middle. So again, in a U-shape, but in this case, it's something of a distorted U-shape because the growth at the high end is significantly larger than, than the low end. Okay, so, so the two main sort of stylized facts we observe here are um, U-shaped pattern of change in employment, distorted U-shaped pattern of change in wage. So how does the economist David Autor analyze this phenomenon? Um, so his analysis is based on the categorization of occupations into three categories. So these three categories are called manual, routine, and abstract. So let's let's review this, this sort of analysis. So according to David Autor, um, in a manual occupation, typical requirements are visual and language processing, um, situational adaptivity, interpersonal skills, and manual dexterity. And examples of such occupations would be food, retail services, security, and personal care. So, so basically, those, these would correspond roughly to these three occupational categories in the first graph. And an attribute of these occupations is that there's relatively little training requirement, and so barriers to entry are low. Um, the second category of occupation he considers are what he calls routine occupations. Now, the defining characteristic of a routine occupation is that it requires precise execution of repetitive tasks. An example would be um, bookkeeping, assembly line manufacturing, or retail clerical work before the introduction of, sort of barcodes, scanners, etc. And so for these tasks, although the work is repetitive, nevertheless, it's necessary to accurately perform the task every time. There's very high premium on, on accuracy and a cost to mistakes. So working in such a job requires the ability to maintain a relatively high degree of focus for a sustained period of time. And as such, this, the, the barriers to entry to this job are sort of considered to be medium. 
um, higher than that of, of what he calls manual jobs. The final category um, Autor considers are abstract jobs. The requirements for these jobs would be sort of analytical skills, creativity, persuasion, planning or strategy, and information synthesis. And so examples, according to Autor, of such jobs are management, science, engineering, and, and law. And for these jobs, as you might imagine, there's fairly significant educational requirements, so barriers to entry are high. Now, I think this categorization scheme, like any scheme, is not, is not a precise reflection of reality. There are many jobs which don't fit into these three categories neatly, but nevertheless, I think it's sort of a useful schema. So um, what is what is Autor's theory about what's happened since the 1980s? His theory is that Computerization substitutes mainly for routine work, not manual or abstract work. And this makes sense if we think about the definition of routine work. It requires the precise execution of repetitive tasks. This is exactly what computers conventionally have been very good at. If you can um, completely define the task as an algorithm, a computer will execute it with much higher degree of precision, much higher reliability than a human. Okay. And so here's another graph with the same x-axis we saw before, 1980 mean wage. The y-axis, we have some heuristic categorization of jobs according to the proportion of work required of that job that is routine. And so we, we see, again, a spike around maybe the 30th percentile here in terms of the maximum amount of routine work required in a job. And so Autor's theory is that computerization substitutes heavily for these highly routine jobs. And this, this can in part explain the decline in employment we see um, in, in the corresponding uh, graph and changes in employment since 1980. So in detail, what is Autor's analysis of what's happened to work since the introduction of computerization, the personal computer in the 1980s? Well, um, he says that for manual jobs, um, the role of computerization is minimal because computers in their classical form are not very good at visual and language processing, interpersonal skills, or dexterity. Um, there's been an increase in demand for the work. Um, barriers to entry are, are low. So because of the increase in demand and low barriers to entry, there's been an increase in employment and something of an increase in wage, though the increase in wage has been muted due to um, increase in labor pool due to the low barriers of entry. Um, what's happened to routine jobs since the 1980s. Well, as we said before, according to Autor's analysis, for many routine jobs, personal computers can substitute wholly or partly for the work. So even though that there's an, there's an increase in demand for the work product, and even though there's a medium level of barriers to entry, nevertheless, employment in this category has declined and wages have grown slowly because to maintain a job in such, in such, a, such a sector, um, routine workers would need to basically provide the service to their employer at a cheaper price than the personal computer can. Lastly, let's consider abstract jobs. Now, according to Autor's analysis, um, abstract jobs, in fact, interact quite differently than routine or manual jobs with computerization. This is because a supporting function required for many abstract jobs is the retrieval of information and the analysis of that information. Computers make this supporting function much easier. Um, it's much easier to you know, do a Google Scholar search than it is to go to the library. And um, computer is also very good at data analysis. So, so then the conclusion is that in fact, the personal computer complemented abstract workers. It made them more productive at their work. So every unit of effort an abstract worker invests in their job produces more benefit to their employer than, than previously. Um, Furthermore, there just uh, there's as the other categories, there's been an increase in demand for the work product, and the levels of barrier of barriers to entry to this job category are relatively high. So, consequently, there's been an increase in in share of employment in this category because the increase in demand for the work product, but be, but because of the high barriers to entry and because of the complementary nature of the innovation, wages have still grown quite quickly. Um, in fact, much higher for this category, as we saw earlier, than um, for the other two categories. Okay, so this is how Autor understands the changes in employment and changes in wages since the 1980s. 
as a function of the introduction of computers, how they differentially affected different categories of job. So, so to, to recap, computerization polarized the workforce by substituting for routine, but not manual and not abstract work. Another way to understand this is this famous paradox by the philosopher Paul Yanni. Um, here I'm quoting it in a form paraphrased by uh, Bryn Jolson et al. And that, that, that paradox states that knowledge is difficult to codify because individuals perform many tasks they cannot articulate. So in other words, it's difficult for computers to substitute for abstract or manual jobs because the, in these jobs, there's many tasks that workers perform that are very difficult to sort of concretely, like precisely and, and exhaustively describe. Um, whereas routine jobs are more, more susceptible to being completely described, completely articulated, and therefore um, substituted by an algorithm. Okay, so that was our first part. We sort of looked back at a previous technological revolution and looked at um, a theory by a, a leading economist as to what happened in that technological revolution. Now let's let's stop looking backwards. Now let's look forwards. Um, let's look at the, the main interest of this talk, which is what impact will large language models have? Now, in looking forward, we don't have the benefit of being able to draw on sort of a large scale study because you know, the historical events we need to study haven't happened yet, but we can look at micro scale studies and maybe extrapolate from them. So that's what I'm gonna do here. So I'm gonna draw from a paper called Generative AI at Work by Bryn Jolfson, Raymond and Lee. Um, it's recently published as a working paper of the National Bureau of Economics Research. And so this is sort of a case study. Now in this case study, um, it, it's a study of the introduction of an AI tool at a firm. And so what is the firm? The firm is basically an enterprise software company, an unnamed enterprise software company, the paper calls the data firm, which employs workers as sort of chat technical support agents. Now this, this, this company, the data firm, contacts another firm called the AI firm. And it, con it contracts the AI firm to deploy a large language model based tool to assist its technical support agents. Um, the tool was rolled out in a staggered way between um, October 2020 and May 2021. So the authors analyzed this rollout to try to understand the impact of this large language model based tool on productivity. Okay, so, so to understand the case study, it's necessary to understand what is the job actually that these chat support agents actually do. So mainly their job is to help customers solve um, technical issues with the software they have bought from the data firm. In particular, um, the client and the agent will, will engage in a chat. So the client sends a message, then the agent sends a message, then the client sends a message, then the agent sends a message, back and forth until either the technical problem is resolved or the agent needs to escalate to their manager or some other technical support agent. Or in fact, we have a failure, the problem isn't able to be resolved and the agent needs to um, sort of log the issue and contact the client at some future time once a, once a solution can be figured out. Okay, so what is, what's the large language model based tool that the AI firm deploys? Um, well, the description given in the paper is quite high level. However, what I've, what I've illustrated here is my inference about what's, what the tool is doing based on, on my reading of the paper. Um, so, so basically here's, here's an illustration of how I, how I think according to this description, the large language model is, is being fine tuned. So they start, they say the core of their system is some recent version of GPT, and then they fine tune it. And they fine tune it on the chat logs of interactions between clients and technical support agents. So the, the, fine, the first fine tuning objective is just language modeling on this data. So given that the past history of the conversation between the agent and the client, the large language model is, is trained to predict the tokens of the agent's next message. So basically predict the agent's message one token at a time. And then there's some loss based on the accuracy with which the model can predict the next token of the agent's message. However, this is not a unconditional language modeling objective. Instead, it is a conditional language modeling objective. In particular, um, when, when the system is generating its prediction of the agent's next message, it conditions on three variables. 
these three variables are, first of all, was the call successfully resolved with the, with the uh, client? Second of all, how quickly was the call resolved? And third, what is the productivity rating of the customer support agent in the data firm's internal software system? So conditioned on these three variables, the model is fine-tuned to predict the tokens of the agent's message. Um, additionally, there's some further fine tuning for what the paper calls empathetic language. And also there's fine tuning to create the model to surface relevant documentation. However, details of how, how this is done are not provided in the paper. Okay, so say that we've, we've done this fine tuning of this large language model, what happens next? Um, well, the model is deployed and here is an illustration of the deployment strategy. So in the middle of a conversation between a client and an agent, the conversation history so far is passed to the large language model. The large language model then, according to what it's been trained on, we saw previously, outputs a suggested next message. Um, now remember, we fine tuned it so that it required some conditioning variables. So the conditioning variables that are used at the time of employment are fixed. That is, at the time of deployment, we fix that the call is successfully resolved, the speed of resolution is fast, and the rating of the customer support agent is high. Then conditioned on the chat history and these three variables, the model predicts a suggested next text message. And then the agent receives this prediction and is free to either accept it and send it directly to the client, edit it, and then send an edited version to the client, or ignore it and send their own, own version to the client. Okay. So, so now let's let's talk about um, or for, actually first, here is an example from the paper of um, the interface that one of the customer support agents might see. Um, so here we have uh, the client sending a message saying, you know, my name is my name is Alex. I am super frustrated. Um, my website isn't loading. And then here are some suggested responses from the language modeling based system that the the agent may use or edit or ignore. So, for example, um, this one says, "I completely understand, Alex. I can definitely assist you with this. Could you please provide the email associated with the account?" And the other one says, "It's nice to meet you, Alex. Happy to get this." Um, to help you get this fixed ASAP, to set expectations, what I'll do is first find your account with, with us in the system, and then we can walk through step by step. Sound good? So I guess you'll notice that both these responses are sort of extremely positive, extremely upbeat, extremely polite in tone, but also in addition to their tone, they also drive towards a solution of the problem. So they both take some first step of asking for, for an email or saying we're going to walk you through step by step. Okay, so, so the authors, um, they want to analyze the effect of the introduction of this language model based tool on the productivity of the chat support agents. So what data do they base their analysis on? Well, they, they have access to the data firm's company data face, which, which includes chat logs, employee performance information, et cetera. And their goal is to understand the impact of the tool on work and productivity. The key productivity metrics that they're interested in are well, chats per hour, how many, how many chats, how many clients does the agent chat with per hour? Resolution rate, which is the proportion of the chats which are successfully resolved. Um, remember back here that chats can either be resolved or escalate or be, be a failure. So we want to see the proportion of chats that are successfully resolved. And then the product of these two things, which is resolution per hour. Now, in the study, there's about 5,000 workers. And over the court, the time period of the study, they engage in something like 3 million chats. All right, so what is the empirical strategy that these economists use to study the data with which they're working? Um, well, the main empirical strategy that they use is called difference in differences. Um, so, so the goal of this is basically to measure the effect of the language model on productivity. So they, they basically, they run a linear regression of this form. So here, yit is some productivity measure of agent i at time t. Um, lit is an indicator variable of whether agent i has access to the language modeling tool, language model chat assistant tool at time t. And then they fit the regression 
to basically learn beta, which is a coefficient telling you the impact of LIT on productivity, and then YI, which is some agent-specific um, productivity baseline, and delta T, which is some modifier to productivity based on the time period. So this is to account for the fact that maybe at certain times of year, the questions that agents are asked are particularly hard or easy to resolve. Perhaps you know they're particularly hard at tax season or something like that. So, so by including these two variables, we can we can control for agent productivity and um, sort of time effects. So then, then in summary, the goal of fitting this regression is to find beta, i.e. measure the effect of the language model on productivity, controlling for agent capabilities and controlling for seasonal effects. Um, now I'll remind my machine learning colleagues that, um, you know, this is, this is an econometric regression. This is an econometric model. So the purpose of a machine learning model is to make predictions or to generate data. But the purpose of an econometric model is not that. The purpose of the econometric model is to understand the sort of the, uh, understand the causal effects going on in a data set. And, and since the goal is understanding um, in econometric contexts, using a simple explainable model like linear regression is often a good choice. Okay, so that was the first empirical strategy. So basically fit this, fit this regression, look at beta. The second empirical strategy is um, very similar. It's called an event study. It's basically identical to a difference in differences regression, except that instead of there being only one beta here, there are multiple betas. This is to account for the fact that the effect of the large language model on productivity may vary over sort of the time period since adoption. So maybe you know, in the first month after adoption of the tool, there's one productivity effect, but then several months later, there's a different productivity effect. So that, that difference can't be captured in the difference in differences regression, but can be captured in the event study regression. All right. So what is what are the, the top line results? So this table contains the top line results. So each of the columns in this table corresponds to a different specification of the difference and differences regression. That is, they change what are the control variables on the right-hand side here. And then the first row of this table shows the estimated value of beta, which remember is the effect of the language model on um, resolutions per hour in this case, in, in that specification. So then I think we can focus on this column for our purposes now. So here they get an estimated beta of 0 0.3, which according to their analysis is very highly significant. Um, so this suggests that use of the language modeling based tool controlling for all of these factors causes um, an increase in resolutions per hour of about 0 0.3. The base resolutions per hour is about 2.174. So um, this is about a 14% increase in resolutions per hour as a result of the adoption of this language model based tool, which is sort of definitely non-trivial, nothing to sniff at. So remember that in addition to doing differences and differences, we're also looking at event studies. So here, here's the results of the event studies. So in the x-axis, we have sort of months from the deployment of the tool. And y-axis, we have the estimated effect, in this case, on log resolutions per hour of the tool. And the results are similar. We can see that it seems to take about approximately two months for um, the agents to receive maximum benefit from the language modeling-based tool. Um, in addition to studying the effect of the tool on productivity, the authors are also interested in the effect of the tool on the sentiment of customers. That is, um, how positive or negatively they treat the agents. This is important because agents who are treated negatively um, may, you know, if they're, if they're abused by customers, if they if they're have customers being very angry at them, they may be inclined to, to quit. Um, so the technique that the authors use is they take basically the, the chat histories between clients and agents, they take all the client messages, they pass them through um, this uh, Cybert model, which is a sentiment analysis model you can get from Hugging Face, and which will output a score of the sentiment of text. So negative one in this, in this scheme corresponds to extremely negative sentiment, for example, abusive, angry, um, vituperative sentiment, whereas positive one corresponds to appreciative, sort of, you know, friendly, friendly, uh, uh, text. So they want to understand if the introduction of the language model based tool affects the sentiment of the customers in their interaction with the agents.
And indeed, there does seem to be a spike. So again, we have an event study here. X-axis is months from AI deployment. And Y-axis is um, customer sentiment as measured by cyber. And again, we see a spike in customer sentiment at the time of the adoption of the, of the tool. This change amounts to slightly more than half a standard deviation is, and is quite significant. So this may be good for retention of employees in the call center if they're um, receiving much more positive sentiment from the customers they interact. Another question you might have is, you know, is the impact of this tool homogenous across the workforce or is it in fact heterogeneous? That is, does it in fact different workers differently? Now, there are many ways that you could partition the workforce to do such a study. One interesting approach is to partition by um, agent productivity prior to the introduction of the tool. So that's what they do here. So they look at the quintiles of the productivity of agents before they adopt the tool. And then they look at, um, on the y-axis here, the log of how the resolutions per hour um, of the agent is modified. That is the change in log resolutions per hour after the adoption of the tool. And I think the effect illustrated in this graph is quite striking. Um, in particular, the tool produces a large increase in productivity for agents who previously were in the lowest quintile of productivity. On the other hand, for agents who were previously in the highest quintile of productivity, the most productive agents prior to the introduction of the tool, the gain is sort of marginal and not significant. Now, this is actually quite interesting. And it's consistent with you know, our view like, of how the model was trained. So remember that the model is trained to generate text. It's fine-tuned to generate text conditional on, among other things, the productivity rating of the customer support agent. And then at the time of deployment, we force the rating of the customer support agent to be high. In other words, at the time of deployment, we're asking the model to simulate the responses that would be provided by a highly rated customer support agent. So given this deployment strategy, what we find here in this heterogeneity makes sense because agents who were previously high productivity, they don't need to simulate the responses of a high productivity agent. They are a high productivity agent. On the other hand, in the lowest quintile, perhaps these agents would not otherwise be able to um, produce the responses similar to a high quality agent. So they benefit most from the tool. So I thought this was a very interesting point. Another question you might ask is, you know, what proportion of time do agents actually use the tool? Remember, they, they're free to either accept, um, edit, or ignore the suggestions of the tool. So um, the author is interested in what proportion of time do they adhere to its recommendation? Now, their definition of adherence is either directly accept the tool's suggestion or accept a very lightly edited version of the suggestion. Um, and then in this graph, we have x-axis is time since deployment, y-axis is percent adherence to the suggestions of the tool, and the colors correspond to the prior tenure of the workers. So we can notice that initially, um, new workers are most likely to use the, adhere to the suggestions of the tool, whereas veterans are least likely. But over time, all three categories of workers converge to accepting the suggestions or adhering to the suggestions of the tool, something like 40% of the time. Um, another thing we can look at is how does, the, how does the use of the tool affect other variables of interest in the workforce? Um, one variable of interest is how likely it is, is it that a worker will quit in a given month? Um, it seems like the tool causes it about an 8% reduction in the likelihood of a worker leaving, which is very significant. Um, and very valuable to the employer because it reduces the need for retraining. Um, also, it causes a significant reduction in the proportion of time customers request speaking to the manager. Um, but the chain requests to transfer to another agent are not significantly affected. Um, however, these two would definitely be of interest to the data firm, definitely be valuable. All right, so let's summarize this paper. Um, so, so basically, the author has found that adoption of a language model tool gives about a 14% boost in productivity. Um, it improves customer sentiment, and most of the gains accrue to the lowest productivity workers. Um, so in this example, we can understand what the language model-based tool is doing as sort of diffusing tacit skills 
from the most productive workers to the least productive workers. And in some sense, it is equalizing the skill distribution of workforce or compressing the skill distribution of the workforce. Um, one question I had is, how would such a tool handle a major software upgrade? Um, because if, if software is upgraded, then a large proportion of the chat conversations upon which the tool was fine-tuned would become sort of irrelevant and possibly misleading. So maybe the tool would then produce um, sort of misleading and not useful suggestions to the customer support agents. And one possible solution would be, you know, one of these techniques here, perhaps a retrieval language model, a true language model, or an augmented language model more generally. Um, these are all techniques which allow, in some sense, the separation of the knowledge of a language model from its linguistic capabilities. And therefore, if we did this, this would allow um, the, the data firm to independently upgrade the knowledge base of the tool without needing to retrain the model. And perhaps this would allow it to handle a software upgrade much more seamlessly. Um, another question that I had um, about this, and which was in fact asked when I when I presented this talk originally, was um, is this is this tool sort of augmenting workers, is it or is it teaching them? That is, what would happen if after say six months of using this tool, the tool was removed and the workers were forced to engage in their chat support job as they previously had? Um, like one point of view might, you might have is that the workers had become over-dependent on the tool and therefore their productivity would decline. But another point of view you could have is that in fact, the tool is in some sense like a mentor or, or in some sense like a pair programmer almost, although they're not programming, but the same idea, a pair, pair uh, like a, a teacher for the agents, in which case perhaps even removing the tool, you might expect that the agent's productivity would still be higher than baseline. I think that would be an interesting experiment. Okay, so, so we had two parts of this talk. The first was looking at the past using the framework of David Autor. And the second was looking at the present using a case study from Bryn Jolfson et al. So can we apply Autor's framework to analyze the case study of Bryn Jolfson et al? Well, first of all, a big part of Autor's framework was categorizing jobs into three categories, manual, routine, and abstract. So what kind of job is the work of the customer support agent in Bryn Jolfson et al's case study. Um, well, well, I would say, as I was saying before, that many jobs don't fit exactly into this scheme. In particular, I would say that this job doesn't fit exactly into Autor's scheme. I would say that um, the job of the customer support agent is sort of a mix of manual and abstract because it involves interpersonal skills, it involves linguistic capabilities, but also it involves a very significant amount of like problem solving, um, debugging, troubleshooting. Um, so this is in some sense an analytical job as well. And to reinforce this point, if we go back to the very beginning of this, this discussion of this paper, um, we note that the mean length of chats between clients and agents is 40 minutes. This is, this is a substantial amount of time. So it's clear that these workers are not doing sort of trivial script following, following debugging. They're doing um, significant hard work. And, and so maybe maybe they should be categorized as sort of a mixture of manual and abstract. Another important thing in Autor's analysis was um, the kind of automation. How, do, how does the automation work? Does it substitute for workers or does it complement workers? Um, in this example, it's pretty clear that the, the tool complements workers and does not substitute for them. Because after all, they're, they're still, even at the end, accepting or adhering to the suggestions of the tool only 40% of the time. So there's no indication that this tool at least could replace workers completely. Um, how, how did the tool affect barriers to entry? Um, well, we saw here that the boost to productivity is greatest for the, the workers with the lowest original productivity. So I think you could argue that we would expect this tool to decrease barriers to entry. We'd expect it to do so because it makes the least productivity workers more productive and so perhaps increases the pool of um, increases the pool of workers for whom, um, whom would be qualified to do this job. And lastly, what kind of skills are being automated here? Um, I would say that it's linguistic interpersonal skills that are being automated, but also in some sense, problem solving skills are also being automated because the suggested responses do, do contain sort of possible solutions to the customer's problem. So remember early on, we discussed Pugliani's paradox like way back um, way back here, talking about how certain tasks are hard to automate because they require, um, you know, 
individuals to perform work that's very hard to describe or articulate precisely. So in this case study, in some sense, we're seeing the limits imposed by Pugliani's paradox pushed. We're seeing interpersonal linguistic skills and problem solving skills being partly automated, which was previously not possible. Okay, and so let's have a concluding discussion here. Um, so I think a, a thing that many people are concerned about is large language models as substitutes, not complements for labor. And so the question is, will large language models or generative AI more generally do, like completely replace certain workers in certain jobs? I would say maybe for certain jobs, yes. Um, it's language models do seem good at some, some kind of copywriting, um, certain forms of, of art, certain forms of illustration and design. Those seem like perhaps they could be completely automated, though it still remains to be seen in detail. Um, so, so there is a possibility for substitution, I would say. But also, I would also argue that the language models we have today, um, they do lack some essential capabilities that are required for many jobs. Um, an example of such a capability is planning. That is, you know, forming a view of the world, um, identifying an objective, forming a plan to achieve that objective, updating your view of the world based on new information, updating your plan, and so on. It seems that language models aren't that good at this. Um, and, there, and there's a few papers discussing this, this sort of gap in the capabilities of large language models. These were actually referenced in a recent talk by Jan bon LeCun. So given language models as we have now, even, even GPT-4, this paper looks at GPT-4 and still finds that its language, its, its planning capabilities are quite a bit worse than those of the average human being. So, so given this, it seems like there are many jobs to which planning is a core component. And these jobs, I think we don't have evidence that large language models could currently substitute for them in any way. However, they may change sort of many of the supporting functions of these jobs. Um, also, I just want to mention there's a few other studies of the effect of language models on productivity. There's a randomized control trial of chat GPT for professional writing, a randomized control trial for Git of, of uh, GitHub Copilot for coding. Um, I found these were very interesting studies, um, but out of necessity, the tasks that they had the, um, the participants perform were in some sense uh, artificial or, or slightly contrived. So I found them less convincing than the, than the study of Bryn Jolson et al, because even though that study was, was observational and not randomized, nevertheless, it was in a real actual workforce. And so um, I, think, I think it's probably, its results are more faithful to what you could expect. Okay, so what's the conclusion? The conclusion is that, well, automation since the 1980s has been limited by this Pugliani's paradox, which is that tasks which are hard to describe are hard to automate. But large language models may expand the scope of automation beyond the limit imposed by Pugliani's paradox, um, Pugliani's paradox, because um, they enable, to some extent, automation of tasks which are difficult to precisely describe. Um, there's evidence in this study that um, large language model automation may have an equalizing effect on the workforce. It may compress the skill distribution of the workforce. But it's not clear if this is specific to this call center context or it would generalize to other kinds of workforces. And just lastly, my view is that there are many job tasks which are beyond the capabilities of even the most impressive large language models today. And lastly, I'll observe that, um, you know, I, I'm interested to see what happens next. Here, here's, a, here's a plot from another paper by the economist David Autor. Here we have on the x-axis, job categories on the y-axis, we have employment. And this, this plot shows basically the proportion of um, people employed in 2018 who are working jobs that existed in 1940 versus those employed in 2018 working jobs which have been created in the time between 1940 and 2018. And so if you add it all up, you find that about 60% of 2018 workers are employed in jobs that did not exist in, in 1940. So we've talked a lot here about the effect of large language models on existing jobs. But I think the more interesting question is, which new jobs that we can't even conceive of now will be created in the future by the introduction of this new technology? Um, what, are, what are sort of the new frontiers? I'm very excited to, to find out. Thank, thanks for listening to my talk. I hope it was interesting and useful to you.